Hello, and welcome to First Christian Church Adult Fellowship Bible Study. This is our fifth lesson in First Maccabees, and it covers the material in chapter 4, starting in uh, verse 26 and continuing on to the end of that chapter, which I believe is verse 61. Recall from last time that this setting is in the middle of the what's called the Maccabean Revolt or the Maccabean-led Jewish Revolt against the uh, Syrian Greek Seleucid uh, King Antiochus IV. He had prohibited upon death any worship of the Jewish faith and had also instituted his pagan religion in the Second Temple. Uh, that event is known and it's what Daniel is describing as the abomination of desolation in, in Daniel. A civil war has been going on now for a couple of years. Uh, so far, the Maccabean Jews have won all battles, although they are greatly outnumbered in every battle, all these battles being fought on their home turf. The last battle was the Battle of Emmaus, uh, led mostly, though, uh, by the Ptolemies, which were the Egyptian group uh, from the south that the Seleucids have been able to recruit uh, in, into their, their force. And they were led, although not on the battlefield, but overall were led by the deputy king Lysias, who we'll talk more about today. They were completely, that is, the Seleucids were completely routed, and they fled back to the coastal plain uh, of Philistine, uh, which was a Seleucid colonized, uh, very uh, allied territory on the coastal plain, and awaited further actions that they were going to have with the Maccabees. In verse 26 through 35, uh, with this deputy king, uh, Lysias, learning about, he's learning about the defeat of his army that he had sent out. And he now is basically making the decision he will lead the next battle. But that does not occur for at least about a year. When it does, both armies have increased in size such that the Seleucid army that is led by Lysias uh, will number about 65,000 and Maccabeans about 10,000. Lysias moves his army in from the south and southeast rather than directly from the west as had been done previously uh, into the Judean hills south there and also around to the east and, and north, uh, which is the area that borders uh, the province of what was called Adame at the time. He encamps his army at Belzer, or Bethzer, which is about 25 miles due south of Jerusalem. The Jews are again fearful when they learn of this big army in front of them. So Judas goes through his normal ritual of leading them in prayer with a battle before the, immediately before the battle. First of all, thanking God for previous victories and asking for his help in this battle. And he, interestingly, the Jewish writer here writing at this time refers, says that he refers to his people, that is Judas, this case, the leader of the army, Jewish army, Israel, the people who love God and the people, the only people essentially who know his name. But as before, the Israelites inflict heavy, heavy casualties on the initial troops that assault them, that is the Seleucids, and rout them, and this large army then quickly withdraws uh, for a fight on another day. Uh, that's pretty well a description of this battle, although it was a very large army. Things get under control in a quick area. But back in verse 28, the writer here said that, sort of indicates that these Seleucids are taking a year to figure out 
how to deal with these Jews, that the Jews have really got them off step. But he doesn't say anything about what happens during this time. And it turns out that what happened during this year was quite significant and is discussed elsewhere, including Second Maccabees, but in a lot of other outside uh, literature. And so uh, instead of the people, the Seleucids being perplexed, as is described here, although they may very well have been, the other literature, as I said, including even Second Maccabees, has a lot to say about this. And during this year, first of all, the Seleucids offered a uh, full and peace amnesty to the uh, Jews, uh, specifically to the uh, Maccabean Jews, in March of 164 BC. And so the specific things are recorded. It's, it's there in other sources of literature, which have allowed them to actually return to their normal ruling that they had had for the previous 300 years that is, rule themselves and practice their own religion in the temple. Why this offer was eject, rejected is not clear, or not much even said about it in other literature, uh, including Second Maccabees. But it is clear that both sides were using this period of time uh, to build their armies and get ready for a, a bigger battle. And that in itself may have been enough for uh, Maccabee to realize, well, there's no need of agreeing to a peace uh, because they're coming after us anyway. In addition, the Jews used this time to reclaim and rededicate their temple, which had been, which is described uh, in verses 36 through 61. As you read that material, pay particular attention to your footnotes and references to other places in the Old Testament because it's going to be necessary if you're going to understand what's going on. It will often be referring to specific books in the Old Testament, especially Leviticus uh, chapter 21 and Exodus chapters 25 through 27, as well as a story in Second Chronicles. Essentially, the purity laws for priests and temple are keys to understanding what these this ancestral Jewish uh, religion believed and practiced and their points of view. If you don't do that and you try to approach it from either a modern Jewish uh, religious standpoint or a modern Christian standpoint, uh, you're going to be lost because this is, this is set in this reference to this ancestral Jewish religious concept, that is the old religion. When they return to the temple, they find it is still under guard by the enemy that was left in the citadel, which specifically was charged with, with guarding that temple. So the Maccabean troops had to be deployed to, doesn't say what happened, but at least they were deployed to keep that citadel from interfering. Plus, these troops made great improvements to the general defense of Jerusalem, including established some outstanding walls and watchtowers so, so well constructed uh, that these held even up uh, uh, for the next 200 years up until they were finally breached after a long siege in 70 AD by the Romans. So they did a good job of defending themselves during that time. That's pretty clear from history. The Mount Zion reference that we see here uh, is reference to the high ground around the temple uh, rather than the whole city of Jerusalem. Uh, scholars tell us that they specifically this reference here is to the holy mountain, Mount Zion, being it, that is described in Exodus 15 in the uh, army victory song and that when they refer to them singing that's what they're singing is that victory song morning ritual that's described here we've seen before uh, and that they're mourning because this temple the, the, the state that they find this temple in is terrible that is from their viewpoint uh, understand to these Jews these ancestral 
those Jews practicing the ancestral religion, that the temple is where God's dwelling between heaven and earth meets. It is, it is God's temple. It's not theirs, but it has now been desecrated. So they find it in a desecrated state. Therefore, the Jewish thinking religiously is very askew, not unlike what we studied our class, uh, not in the virtual session, but in real session, that studied Ezekiel a few years ago. And this was exactly the same situation there. In other words, they believed God was there in that temple, and now that that's been desecrated, that is a major, major, major stumbling block in their faith. Uh, Therefore, it is critical that the Jews take proper steps to start the reconsecration in the proper order of this temple uh, and also to reorder their world because until that's properly reordered, their religious thinking, their belief of where their contact is with God is lost. Don't try to read into this from Think about this from our world today, our religious thinking today. Try to place yourself into the thinking of that world that they were in if you expect to make sense of this. So during this uh, undescribed peace sort of thing, temporary peace if you will, they are rededicating their temple or taking the steps to do it. Only certain priests uh, are in proper purity state at any one particular time that they can do this stuff and as recognize that everything has been uh, desecrated and as a priest comes in association with that desecrated material or touches it he himself becomes unpure consequently you have to have a and then he has to go through a major ritual to cleanse himself and therefore this whole process that's being described here is in that setting that as one guy does something he's contaminated others have to come in things for us this is difficult to understand but this is what they believed and so it took them a very regimented uh, pure, uh, schedule of, of events and times and so forth uh, to cleanse this temple. And that's all outlined in the protocols if you look in Leviticus 21. They cannot just burn stuff. In other words, when they found a pagan temple or something out in the wild, out in their territory, they just destroy it and burn it. But they can't do that with the second temple. Why? That's an important thing to make sure you understand because this stuff belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the Jews. It belongs to God. That is their thinking. It is sacred. Yet it's desecrated. Consequently, what to do with it is a issue of paramount importance in their religion. They elect to move as much of the material as they can, especially stones, it appears, uh, to other sites on this holy ground on Mount Zion, but not in temporal in the temple grounds proper and await and this is critical and await the return of a future prophet to direct what to do with it so the only thing they can do is set it aside somewhere or another still on the holy ground and await a future prophet the Maccabeans tell no more. First Maccabees tells no more about what happens there. But uh, we need to understand that they were in a long period, in other words, from before that time to well past that time, in which prophets no longer occurred. Therefore, that's going to be a long wait. However, the Dead Sea Scrolls do tell us when those were discovered, this is one of the most important discoveries that occurred in the Dead Sea Scrolls, was it's outlined there what they thought. And the Dead Sea Scrolls literature is full of this. 
uh, Qumran literature it's often referred to, describes who this prophet is. It's none other than the uh, Aaronite priestly Messiah. Now, make sure we catch that. Notice I said the Aaronite priestly Messiah. They, the, that Dead Sea Scrolls community expected three messiahs, one of them being the, the Aaronite or Aaron, descendant of Aaron priest. So the temple is stripped, uh, re, rebuilt on the inside using all the proper rules as outlined in Exodus 25 to 27. And then on December the 14th, 164 BC, it is rededicated in an eight day ceremony in which sacrifices and offerings are reestablished. That event was also set in perpetuity and it is that eight-day event that the Jews today celebrate as the Feast of Hanukkah, that is, the celebration of rededication. It has a lot of trappings in it that overlap with the Fall Feast of Tabernacles, but that's what, that's what it's about. And by the way, it's on the very anniversary of the day of the birthday of Antiochus the 14th. Or the, I'm sorry, Antiochus the Fourth. Whether that was specifically chosen because of his birthday or for other reasons isn't clear. Uh, I hope you have a good study this week. We'll see you hopefully same time next week with more uh, on First Maccabees.